Thank you, Maria. Can you hear me? Is it clear? Um, it's great to be here. I've never been to Mexico before. Uh, I saw the show yesterday and I, I was surprised. I don't know why I was surprised, but I was surprised at just how sophisticated the show was. I think the connections that are made between Duchamp and Kuhn's are really fascinating. Um, and as Maria said, um, I come to the show um, through an interest in uh, photography. Um, yes, I, 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 strangely, I did, I did write a whole book and uh, I put together a, an entire exhibition that was really about one photograph, which is in the current show at, at Humex, strange picture that Man Ray made of uh, dust gathering on the surface of Duchamp's sculpture, unfinished sculpture, um, the large glass, uh, which is in the show in, the, in a f the form of a projection. And I was interested in that photograph because of its strange status. Uh, it's, the photograph is, a, is an artwork in itself, but it is also a photograph of an artwork so it's also a document. Uh, when it was first published, it was titled View from an Aeroplane. Uh, View prise en aeroplane. N uh, nothing to do with what it's actually of, uh, which is dust gathering on a sheet of glass in Duchamp's studio in New York. Um, and it was a show that made lots of connections between that photograph, other, other ambiguous pictures, aerial photography, abstract photography, uh, other images of dust. But it's not, it's not really what I want to uh, talk about today. Uh, I'm more interested in a, a kind of broader um, question, and I don't have any answers, I'm afraid. <laughs> I know there's something interesting about Duchamp because he raises so many questions. Uh, experts are supposed to have the answers. Um, I think I'm an expert in questions. I, um, Duchamp still puzzles me. I don't, I don't understand his work. Uh, but he was a guiding principle when I, I put together my first book, which was called Art and Photography, which was about the place of photography in art um, since the 1960s. Uh, and it looked at images that were made by photographers. It, was, it also looked at images made by artists who really didn't think of themselves as photographers at all. Um, and it looked at the relation between photography and other media, um, sculpture, painting, performance, things like that. But today I want to I want to think about two things. Uh, it, it sounds quite theoretical, but, but it's not. Um, and I've made the presentation very visual. So if, if you don't like the sound of my voice or the, my words in translation, the presentation should make sense visually. So you can just put your fingers in your ears. Um, and I want to think about two things. One is uh, the ready-made, which is a Duchampian idea or concept, the idea that you might take uh, an industrial object and nominate it as an artwork and make that claim for it and display it in the context of art. And the show has a few of Duchamp's ready-mades. Uh, notably uh, the urinal, which is called Fountain and is uh, ascribed to R. Mutt. Um, also the bottle rack and uh, various other pieces. Um, and I want to think about um, the experience really of, of not being in the gallery 
but of experiencing those ready-mades as photographs. Uh, because that's been a big part of Duchamp's influence and reputation. But at the same time, I, I want to think of the idea of whether a photograph itself can be a ready-made. Um, whether one of the things in the world that could be selected and called a ready-made uh, could be a, a photograph. It, it's a complicated idea that and uh, that's mainly what I want to explore. So um, as you probably know uh, Duchamp submitted this is it a sculpture? Well whatever it is an object uh, an industrially produced uh, urinal turned it on its side put it on a plinth uh, and uh, it was uh, refused uh, uh, submission to an open exhibition and then very soon after um, a little journal which Duchamp was involved with he was very good at cultivating his own reputation uh, a, a journal uh, published a photograph and a little statement about this work being uh, refused and the story goes that very soon the the artwork itself was lost. So it just existed as an idea and it existed as an image and a reproduction of an image in a little journal magazine. But that, even that presentation in that journal is, is interesting. It's, there is a painting in the background, so it, it's not a white background. It's not like a kind of white modern gallery. It's painting in the background, so it situates it in relation to painting. Uh, and there are various claims made by these little texts. So it's signed by R. Mutt, that's one text. And then it also says Fountain by R. Mutt at the top left. Photograph by Alfred Stieglitz, who was a photographer, photographic artist, but also had a gallery and was also a, a kind of conduit for uh, European avant-garde ideas coming into America, New York. And also at the bottom, the exhibit refused by the independents, which is also a kind of authorship. We're being, we're being told that this is a work that's been refused. So it's, it's not just a photograph, that's Duchamp's mother and his grandmother. Um, uh, so it, it, it's not just the photograph. Uh, there's various other bits and pieces of information. We, that it's somehow it's photographed by someone who's important. The fact that it's been refused is important. And also it's been photographed in a particular way that shows it's uh, that's, that's quite a difficult object to photograph. I, I noticed people in the gallery yesterday when they weren't taking selfies in front of Jeff Koons' things, uh, watching people try to photograph a uh, fountain is interesting. Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't quite work in two dimensions. It's a kind of white, curvy object. And in the gallery, it's on a white plinth in a perspex box with a white wall behind and uh, it, optically it's quite a tricky thing so, so it's a very um, emphatic photograph which wants to show it as a sculpture as a kind of three-dimensional object with this heavy shadow so all of these things uh, transform the object itself and enhance it emphasize it in certain ways um, and of course, uh, Duchamp is an artist who is very, very acutely aware of the place of reproduction. It's, he's making work at a point where exhibition catalogues are not illustrated yet. There, there are starting to be avant-garde journals, magazines, but they don't really have photographs in them 
yet that that comes within a within a few years but Duchamp is very aware that um, the reputation of an artwork is significant um, he there had already been a scandal around uh, Duchamp's painting a uh, nude descending a staircase uh, so he had a, he already had a reputation at this point as being transgressive somehow um, so so this is an artist who is who is very well aware of reputation aura reproduction so on interestingly though things get more complicated because Duchamp was very interested in how a viewer actually encounters a very familiar object. Well, I should say it's familiar to men. It's not familiar, it's more exotic to women. Um, it's a very gendered object, this one. You wouldn't say that for the bottle rack uh, or the coat hanger. Um, it's, it's, Clearly, it's familiar to Duchamp. We'll come back to gender in a minute because it's, it's interesting. But let's say it's a familiar object. What happens when you see a familiar object? Uh, I guess, first of all, you're, you're recognizing how familiar it is. And then you're recognizing that it's in the wrong place. It's out of place. It's not... It's not plumbed in on the wall of a bathroom. It's, it's, it's on a plinth. And so Duchamp was actually described this as a snapshot effect, that he, he wanted the impression of seeing it to have the, have the kind of shock or the immediacy of looking at a photograph. You look at a photograph, you recognize what's in it straight away, unless it's abstract. Um, well, that's interesting in itself, um, not just that the, that the artwork could be photographed, but that the artwork should have the same effect as looking at a photograph, a, a kind of easy, quick immediacy. There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing on a formal level to contemplate when you're looking at the urinal. What you're contemplating is, is the idea of it being there somehow. Um, snapshot effect is an in interesting phrase. And of course, uh, there are all kinds of interesting anecdotal images. Uh, these are shots that were taken in Duchamp's studio, uh, which I, I don't know precisely what the status of these pictures is. I don't, I don't know if they were arranged at all for um, the camera. But they look, they look kind of casual to me, and you can see the various, various things. You can see the urinal actually hanging up, not yet on a plinth. And scrappy as they are, these photographs, they, they seem to have become quite important in the history of the ready-mades. A kind of view of them uh, before they get to the gallery. Kind of insider picture, somehow. And of course, Duchamp goes on later in his life to ex explore and really play with the idea of how uh, we experience works in reproduction and we form an opinion about works that we've never actually seen. We've, on, we've only seen their reproduction. This, this happens all the time. It's very difficult to not have an opinion <laughs> on an artwork uh, that you've only seen in reproduction. And so reproductions themselves have a very odd status. Uh, we're, we're sort of in denial of the fact that we, we experience a lot of art and we know a lot of art through books and magazines and now the internet. And we know deep down that, that, that that's unreliable. That's not, that's not the same as encountering the work itself. Uh, but Duchamp understood that that was the way 
art was going, and of course a number of other commentators of Duchamp's generation, Walter Benjamin, André Malraux, Abby Warburg, a, a number of thinkers were approaching the same question, how, what's going to happen when we experience art primarily as reproduction? Now, let's just think about what a, what a photograph is. I've been doing this all my adult life. I'm still not sure. Um, quite often, our sense of what a photograph is often depends on what we compare it with or contrast it with. Let's say we compare photography and painting. I say here, uh, a painter cannot paint their painting and then decide how big it will be or what material it will be made from. Uh, a photographer can. If you're a photographer, and we're all photographers, there, there's capture, you know, you press the shutter, press the button on your smartphone, whatever. You, you, there's the capture of the image, and then you decide what you're going to do with it. Are you going to view it on your phone? Are you going to print it out? Are you going to download it and look at it on a bigger screen? Is it going to be a billboard? Is it going to be a t-shirt? Is it going to be a fine art print? Is it going to be a record cover? There's capture and there's output. That's not really the case with painting. A, a painter doesn't paint their painting and then decide how big it will be or what material it will have. It, your dis, a painter is doing that while they're making the painting. And you could say the same about a sculptor. Although it's complicated with Coons. We'll come to, we'll come to Coons in a minute. Um, but it means that a photograph has no integral uh, relation to scale or, or materiality. You can, I, I think whenever you look at a photograph, let's say in a gallery, you're looking at a choice. Oh, they've, they've decided to present it like this. They've decided to do it big. They've decided to do it small. They've decided to do it glossy. They've decided to print it on rough paper or shiny paper. You, generally, you don't think that when you're looking at a painting. You don't look at a painting and think, oh, they've decided to do it like that. that that's just part of the work. But there are choices involved in, in photography, and they're, they're complicated, I think. Well, Coons is interesting because clearly the idea of blowing something up and blowing something up is, of course, a photographic term. With Coons, it's complicated because there's, there's blow up as in to enlarge, but there's also blow up as in to <laughs> inflate something or overinflate something. Um, depends on your attitude to Coons. Uh, so I think when you're looking at Coons's work, these two have this very strange double relation to photography that the ready-made has. Um, because you look at that, you look at the object that Coons presents, and you're, th you're thinking that's not its usual size. He's decided to do something with it, 10 feet tall, 8 feet tall, whatever. Um, and he's decided to change its materials. And you look at those things and you don't know, is it plastic? Is it made of polished steel? So I think Coons's Kuhn's, work can be understood in a photographic way. This has got nothing to do with taking selfies in front of it. I, th I think the experience of Coons's sculptures is, is photographic in the way that Duchamp understood the experience of the ready-made being photographic. And that means Coons's work has a different relation to reproduction because the primary experience of the work is quite photographic, I would say. Hmm. Now let's think, let's go back to the idea of a ready-made and think about 
whether a photograph itself could be a ready-made. So instead of choosing a bottle or a urinal, could, could a photograph be chosen and presented in that way? It's a complicated point. This is a, uh, the first of many books made by the Californian artist Edward Rouchet. Uh, he self-published a book 1963 called 26 Gasoline Stations and all his books have straightforward titles and what, what you find in this book is 26 photographs of gasoline stations. In an interview, uh, Rouchet talked about the influence of Duchamp and the, and the whole idea of the ready-made and he said this, he said, the ready-made was more, that should be or, not of, more or less a guiding light to me. The idea of calling something a work of art. It's not necessarily that the artist has the freedom to call anything he wants art. It was another side that intrigued me. I suppose it's an extension of the ready-made in photographic form. Instead of going out and calling a gas station art, I'm calling its photograph art. But the photograph isn't the art. The gas station might be. The photograph is just a surrogate gas station, substitute gas station. The photograph by itself doesn't mean anything to me. It's the gas station that's the important thing. As far as I've read that paragraph, hundreds of times and I think he contradicts himself at least four times but that's fine because I, th I think it happens because what he's doing is very perplexing so it's not called 26 photographs of gasoline stations it's called 26 <laughs> gasoline stations we're not supposed to be thinking about the photography although we're clearly not standing in front of gas stations, we're being put in the position of someone who made 26 photographs of gasoline stations. Um, and then Rouchet wants to say, well, the photograph isn't art, the gas station might be, it might not be, uh, the gas station's the important thing, I'm not calling the gas station art, <laughs> fine. Fine. We'd, it's not a legal matter. You don't. You don't have to worry about it. But I. It sounds when you first read that statement like he's being very clear, and <laughs> the more you read it, the more <laughs> contradictory it seems. But let's ac let's accept that those contradictions are in photography. This idea of a photograph being a substitute for another kind of experience. Now, Rochet made the photographs himself. Uh, but if they were related to the idea of Duchamp's ready-made, it was on the basis that the style, or the stylelessness, the lack of style, of the, of the photography uh, that, that was appropriated, not the actual images. So Rochet's not trying to be creative or expressive. He's trying to use photography in a kind of functional, straightforward, industrial way. Maybe in the same way that the urinal is a functional, industrial, straightforward object. In other words, since there was nothing special about the photographs, they may as well have been appropriated. Maybe if Rochet had found a, an archive of photographs of gas stations, that would have been just as good. Maybe it's not really about his photography of them. <laughs> Interestingly, when the book was 50 years old, uh, I, I, by accident, I came across a very uh, beautiful but strange photograph on eBay, which was this, which was a, a, a news photograph. So it's, it's, it was taken by a photographer working for a newspaper 
turned out to be a news, newspaper in Baltimore. And it's of a woman uh, waiting in line for gas at a gas station during the oil crisis of the 70s in, in America. And I thought it was really beautiful in a way that certain kind of pop art images are beautiful. Uh, you, you can see that it doesn't quite look photographic. Um, it's been heavily overpainted, retouched. Um, Photoshop doesn't begin with Photoshop. You know, people made adjustments to pictures before that. Uh, so I'd, I didn't make it. I just, I just found it, and it was ten dollars. And I thought it was extraordinary. And then I ended up making a book that was has some relation to the Ruche book, uh, but was really exploring. I was trying to make sense of that photograph and why that woman was waiting for gas in 1979. And, and so it's a, it's a book of um, news photographs of gas stations. And I don't claim any authorship of the pictures. In fact, I think I made the book more as a curator than an artist. And the first half of the book has the fronts of the pictures. And then the second half of the book has the backs. And on the back, you have the photographer's name, the newspaper, the caption, the date it was used. Uh, so it travels with its own little history, its own little archive. Hmm. I think the closest photography comes to the idea of the ready-made uh, is a very uh, perplexing, paradoxical series of works made by the American artist Sherry Levine in the very early 80s. And she made a number of uh, series of photographs called After, and then the name of the photographer whose images she was re-photographing. After Edward Weston, after Alexander Rochenko, after Walker Evans. And she would present them as a silver gelatin print, you know, the standard form of the kind of fine art photograph, very small in a frame on a wall, and she makes no changes to it. She's not, she's not cropping it, she's not, make, she's not collaging it, she's making a straight copy of a photograph uh, which or, or already has an author and already has a name. So this is Sherry Levine, after Walker Evans, number four, 1981, silver gelatin print, 12.8 by 9.8 centimeters. And we're looking at it as a reproduction on a screen. If you see it in a gallery, it's, it's quite strange uh, because you, 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 you're told it's a photograph by Walker Evans and then laid on top of that is the fact that it's now also a photograph by Sherry Levine but it's the same photograph. She made them, the photographs, the Evans pictures, uh, by photographing this book, which was a very beautifully produced book. So it's a book of reproductions. But the interesting thing about photography is that the reproductions are just as good. You don't, you don't really have to go and see a Walker Evans exhibition if you look at a really good book of his pictures, that's fine, that's good enough. It's a very beautifully printed book. And this is how Sherry Levine made her copies. This is before the digital, so she would she'd have to lay the book flat. She would have to get the camera on a tripod looking straight down and literally re-photograph the photograph. Um, she could have just cut the page out, uh, but she didn't. Um, if she just cut the page out, she wouldn't have a negative, interestingly. And that picture is part of a sequence in that book. And as you may know, Walker Evans was in uh, Hale County, Alabama in 1936, making photographs of tenant farmers. 
and they were in various publications by Evans and they were in a book that he made with James Agee. Uh, Levine has also made copies of some of Marcel Duchamp's works. So here is her copy, now a gold, golden, encrusted, plated version of the fountain. Um, now, can a photograph be a ready-made in the same way that a urinal can? Jeff Wall, who is a photographic artist, who you may have heard of, Canadian, um, he's written a few really smart, interesting, provocative essays over the years. And he wrote one called Depiction, Object, Event. And he, he tries to think very directly about this question. Can a, can a photograph be a ready-made? Can you just select a photograph from the world and nominate it as an artwork? Wall thinks a photograph can't be a ready-made. Depictions, he says, are works of art by definition. So anything that is a depiction of something is already an artwork. They may be popular art, amateur art, even an entirely unskilled and unappealing art, but they are able to nominate themselves as art nonetheless. They are art because the depictive arts are founded on the making of depictions. And that necessarily displays artistry. So any image is already an artwork. In the way that a urinal, Wall would argue, is not an artwork. It can be nominated as an artwork because it's not an artwork. Wall thinks that all photographs, all depictions, are already artworks. They may be bad artworks, they may be popular artworks, whatever, commercial artwork, but they're, they're, on some level they are artworks, so they can't then be re-nominated. <laughs> um, they are art because the depictive arts are founded on the making of depictions, and that necessarily displays artistry. The only distinction remaining to be made here distinctions remaining to be made here are between fine art and applied art, popular art and high art, between amateur art and professional art, and of course between good art and less good art. So he would exclude Levine's gesture as being understood as a ready-made. In fact, for Wall, no depictions can be ready-made. And interestingly, Duchamp himself, of all the things he chose to nominate as ready-mades, uh, none of them are depictions. They're all, they're all objects. Uh, there are some that he called assisted or rectified ready-mades. So famously, the the, the reproduction of the Mona Lisa with the added moustache. But, and he calls that, what does he call that? Assisted or rectified? I can't remember. Rectified. Rectified, yeah. Uh, but that means it's not a ready-made. There's something else. And it's interesting to think why Duchamp didn't just select a pre-existing image and call it a ready-made. He could have done, but he didn't. So, so maybe Duchamp himself understood that depictions were, were different. Maybe. I don't know. I don't have any answers to <laughs> any of these questions. Wall says, since a depiction cannot be selected as a ready-made, depiction is therefore not included in Duchamp's negation. And what then follows in Jeff Wall's argument is that he says if you're a if you're a sculptor or a making of objects you have to face head on what Duchamp did Duchamp changed the game fundamentally but Wall says Duchamp did not change the game fundamentally for the depictive arts 
because depictions can't be ready-mades. So depiction can carry on. Depictive artists can carry on, uh, whereas all the other artists have to confront Duchamp's gesture or Duchamp's move. Well, that's handy for Jeff Wall because he's a photographer who wants to carry on <laughs> making work. It's fine. I was, that was cruel. I, I didn't mean it that way, but we'll come back to it. Um, now, you could say, we could argue the same about a manufactured object such as a urinal. You could say, well, even functional objects are designed. Someone designed them, and that means they are informed by aesthetic choices. Urinals are different. Men will tell you this. They're not all the same. Uh, and so m they must be artworks on some level also. Maybe it's not to do with depiction at all. Maybe Jeff Wall's got it completely wrong. Uh, maybe no thing can really be a ready-made because all things are already potentially artworks. Uh, even in their moment of practical use. Again, I don't know. <laughs> these, are, these are matters for discussion. Now, in another essay, Wall has this to say about Sherry Levine. When Sherry Levine presented her photographs of Evans's pictures, I interpreted the, the work as her saying, quote, study the masters. Do not presume to reinvent photography. Photography is bigger and richer than you think it is in your youthful pride and conceit. I think he's been quite patronizing about Sherry Levine there, but let's take the point seriously. Maybe Levine re-photographing an Evans photograph is drawing our attention to Evans. Maybe it's an act of homage. Maybe it's not a subversion. Maybe it's to say, look at Evans. He was really good. Here's his picture. Um, the usual way that Levine is interpreted is anything from a kind of feminist uh, critique of a kind of masculine canon, uh, or it's a critique of the idea of the photograph being elevated as an artwork, when really it's just a kind of common reproduction. You, none, of the, none of the commentators on Levine, as far as I know, took Wall's position, which is that Levine is just telling you to look again at Evans because he was really good. Not a ready-made at all, just an act of homage. I don't know. So you could say that maybe Duchamp was drawing our attention to the urinal. Could the designer or the manufacturer of the urinal be considered a master to be studied? Study the masters. Don't pretend to be better than... Maybe. Maybe they are making things that are better than any artist can make. This is an interesting question with Duchamp because he gets very interested in anonymous industrial making, craft skills, not artist skills, but kind of artisan craft skills. He really does respect them, I think, and he understands that industrially produced objects are, are beautiful in their own way, sometimes more so than artworks. Now, let's stay with Evans for a while, because I think Evans himself understood an awful lot about this. On that day when he photographed Ali Mae Burroughs, he made four photographs, not one. And in each one, her expression is slightly different. And very often when people see this photograph, they're seeing one of the four different ones. They're very rarely all exhibited together. 
So we think of the photograph as a kind of single image of a unique woman, um, but in fact there are four of them. And if you look very closely at different books by Evans and also different exhibitions of his work, you see that it's, it's actually not the same photograph. Her expression changes. In his 1938 book, which I think is where it was first published, it crops up in a sequence. We see this photograph, then we see this one, then we see this one, then we see him photographing another image, and Evans does this a lot. He often points his cameras at other photographs, commercial posters. Uh, have you already noticed it's a different one? Good. <laughs> In that book, the photograph is captioned, not with her name, but it's captioned Alabama Cotton Tenant Farmer Wife. In the 1941 book, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, Evans has a sequence of 32 pictures and then there's a long text by the writer James A.G. and the two don't really connect. You're left to try and connect them. Look at her expression, it's not, it's not the same one. James A.G. didn't like the name Burroughs. He didn't think it was earthy enough. Although Burroughs is a, sounds like a very, uh, and it was changed in the book to Gudger. I mean, Gudger. Mm, so we're in a hall of mirrors already before Sherry Levine has arrived or anything like that. Oh, now, here's, here's the real connection between Evans and Duchamp and the idea of the photograph as a ready-made. Um, the first papers of surrealism was uh, the first major exhibition in North America of surrealist art. And many of the artists had left Europe. This is during the war, interestingly, it's 1942. And the title, First Papers of Surrealism, is, is a reference to the, to the idea of, during wartime, having to carry identity papers, having to be who you say you are and who your identity claims that you are, the first papers of surrealism. Interestingly, what this catalogue is now famous for, and there's a reference to it in the show, is the fact that the two people that put it together, uh, Marcel Duchamp and André Breton, who was the sort of leader of the surrealist movement, had intended to have photographs of all the artists, you know, to, to, to introduce them to an American audience. So the catalogue was going to have reproductions of their artworks and then a, portraits photographic portraits of the artists. But in the introduction, it says this. It says, finally, not being able to offer an entirely adequate photographic image of each of the principal exhibitors, we have thought it best here to resort to the general scheme of compensation portraits suggested by Duchamp and Breton. So, that is not Breton. That is not René Magritte. That is not Pablo Picasso. But if you think about it, the pictures are not chosen at random. You know, Picasso, cubist, multi yeah. multiple perspectives in one. Yeah, OK, get it. Ha. Juan Miro keeps kept the Catalan spelling of Juan, so, so it's, it's J-O-A-N, which in America would be Joan, yes. woman's name. So they have a picture with a man and a woman in it, so that, that could be, it could be Joan Miro. The Americans don't know. 
or that could be Juan Miro, or neither of them could be Joan Miro or Juan Miro. They don't tell you what a compensation portrait is. They just say, we've resorted to the general scheme. Ha! Huh. This one is in the show. Did you notice yes. it? OK, so that's actually a photograph by Ben Sharn, better known as a painter and illustrator. But he took photographs like Evans did uh, of uh, tenant farmers during the, the mid-1930s. They choose this picture for Leonora, the painter Leonora Carrington. So even before Levine and her postmodernism arrives in 1981, 40 years before, this, the same photograph is already being used in this kind of complicated game of false substitutes. So it's not, the Duchamp picture is not chosen randomly. It's chosen because this woman looks like Duchamp. And of course, Duchamp had a history of representing himself as a woman, this is the, famously in the photographs by, by Man Ray. Leonora Carrington did look a little bit like Ali Mae Burroughs. Um, I've no idea what the artists thought about their own compensation portraits. I don't know if they were horrified by the idea or if they thought it was an interesting surrealist joke or subversion. Now, I'm a photography nerd, historian, sorry, historian. And uh, by chance, I was looking through U.S. Camera Annual, 1939. And that annual has a portfolio of pictures by photographers who are working for the U.S. government, the Farm Security Administration. And there's the picture that's used for Breton. And look, these are together on, this, on the same page. I'm fairly sure that this is the publication that Breton and Duchamp saw. Not just because of the coincidence of them all being in the same <laughs> publication, but this, this is just a, a, a technical point, but it's an interesting one. And Duchamp, as we know, was very technically minded. Uh, that publication, or that portfolio within the publication, was produced in what's called gravure printing. So that's continuous tone printing. So there's no dots. Um, so if you're going to re-photograph it uh, and you're going to make your catalog uh, in, in half tone with dots, if, you've, if you photograph something with dots, you're going to get that weird moiré pattern. And Duchamp, probably not Breton, but Duchamp would have been well aware of this. And because this, these pictures were produced in gravure, it's like photographing a continuous tone photograph. I can't be sure of this, but I, I, I love the idea of Breton and Duchamp being in New York and looking through US camera annual and going, yeah, we'll have that one. And we'll have that one. <laughs> oh, look, that looks a bit like Leonora. Oh, you look a bit like this woman. <laughs> Interestingly, the pictures, when they appeared in this annual, were given captions, which came from comments that visitors made to an exhibition of these pictures. So this one is captioned, Long Live Roosevelt. And this one is captioned, Magnificent Propaganda. That's just so you can see the half, it's quite crudely reproduced, half tone within the, within the catalog itself. You'll also notice that this photograph crops out, it's a tighter crop, which also gives away the fact that they took it from this publication. So they've had to crop it above those letters. See, just. A rose. Gotcha. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> uh, it's, it's maddening the more you look at this. Interestingly, the Levines 
are, are in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And that's how they appear in the online catalogue of the Metropolitan Museum. Interestingly, the Metropolitan Museum owns the Walker Evans archive, and this is how the, the Walker Evans appears. Now, Evans, when he made the pictures, was working for the American government. And the American government owns the copyright. So you are free to reproduce this picture. And I think this is also perhaps why Levine may have chosen Evans. There wasn't going to be a copyright problem because they, they were... I know, it's shocking, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, if you reproduce a Levine, you have to pay copyright. Uh, okay. okay, yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to Evans a second. Evans starts his career in the very late 20s, and he's unbelievably intelligent, and he's unbelievably perceptive about not just the making of photographs, but the idea that there are photographic documents that don't appear to have anything to do with art, and photographs are multiple promiscuous things. You can recontextualize them and they mean new things in new contexts. That's just, that's just the nature of photographs. In 1931, and he's only been photographing a couple of years, he writes an extraordinary essay uh, called The Reappearance of Photography. And it's a, it's a, a kind of a roundup review of several publications which had just appeared. Uh, a book by Adjay, a book by Edward Steichen, um, August Sanders' book, Face of Our Time, and a very interesting publication called Photo Eye. And he took a book of Eugene Adjay pictures had just been published after Adjay's death. And Evans knew that the Surrealists had... Man Ray lived on the same street as Ajay and knew Ajay and bought several photographs from him that were then used within the Surrealist journal, uh, La Révolution Surrealiste. So this photograph by Ajay is bought by Man Ray and Man Ray uses it on the cover of La Révolution Surrealiste and it's given a different title. It's called Le Dernier Conversion, which is a sort of reference to Catholicism, actually, like the last conversion. They're all... It's, it's actually a photograph of a group of people uh, looking at an eclipse. Le Dernier Conversion. And the Surrealists did this quite a lot. They used, they used documents that weren't made as artworks and then subverted them in one form or another. So Ajay uh, Evans sees this. He, he notices this and tells the reader about it. He also looks at this book called Photo Eye, which was a sort of summary of modernist photography or modern attitudes towards photography. And he notices that among the art photographs in this book are quite shocking documents, like a corpse in a street, for example. And Evans was very suspicious about the idea of a photographer being arty or over-expressionistic. Evans felt that you shouldn't... The, the artistic impulse shouldn't overcome the documentary status of the picture. It could add to it, but it shouldn't, you shouldn't overstep the mark. And Evans writes, the latter half of the 19th century offers that fantastic figure, the art photographer, really an unsuccessful painter with a bag of mysterious tricks. He's by no means a dead tradition even now, still gathered into clubs to exhibit their pictures of misty October lanes, snow scenes, reflets dans l'eau, young girls with crystal balls. In these groups arises the loud and very suspicious protest about photography being an art. 
So there is, in one of the anthologies under review, a photograph of a corpse in a pool of blood, and then in italics, it's his italics, because you like nice things. <laughs> and so he sees that this book is, is quite an interesting book, that it has photographs made by artists being arty, and then into the book, the editors have placed these news photographs, which are shocking, very shocking. The first time Evans gets to do pictures for a book, a substantial portfolio for a book, uh, is, is this. Uh, Carlton Beals was a journalist who was writing a political expose of the corrupt Machado regime in Cuba. And Evans was commissioned to make photographs, but he never liked to make photographs illustrating text. So he proposed a sequence of photographs that would stand on their own at the back of the book. So you could read Beals's expose and you could just look at Evans's pictures. And Evans, is, Evans gives you a series of lyrical, very observant street shots of everyday life, mainly in Havana. But while he was there, he goes to a newspaper office and he buys negatives of murdered dissidents and imprisoned students. And he drops into his sequence photographs that are not by him. So anonymous photograph, a document of the terror, Gonzalez Ribiera. So he gives up his own authorship. These are Evans's pictures. To shock, these, these are not the kinds of pictures Evans would make. He wasn't that kind of journalist. But he, he understood the value of them, and they, he understood that they would shock and they would subvert any artistic idea about photography, you know, kind of forceful document of a murdered body. Hmm. Well, one can't really understand the art of the 20th century without the idea of photographs being borrowed and reused. It's there within surrealism, it's there in Dada. You can't, you can't even begin to think about pop art without thinking of media images or news images being reused. Never really as a ready-made. Uh, they're reworked or they're re, they're, they are rectified or assisted. <laughs> in one way or another. There are moments where things come close. This is a book uh, first published in 1977 by Mike Mandel and Larry Sultan, and it's just called Evidence. No picture on the cover, just the word evidence. And they went to the archives of the pol American police force, fire departments, industrial corporations, and they gathered images from those archives which had functioned as evidence, but now you take them out of that context and you just put them in a book with no captions. And they're not, they might be evidence, but we don't know what they're evidence of anymore. So even the most functional photograph is not very functional. Um, photographs do not carry meanings the way that a truck carries coal down the street. They, images can't really do that. They can be made to do that with a caption and a certain kind of context, but take them away from that and you realize that all photographs are ambiguous and a, and a kind of wild energy gets released from them. Richard Prince, really the same <clears throat> generation of artists as Sherry Levine, <clears throat> would re-photograph images from uh, magazine advertisements, you know, famously the Marlboro Cowboys horses. And I think at one point, a, a, a Richard Prince re-photograph of a Marlboro Cowboy was the most expensive art photograph ever bought at auction, interestingly. 
Uh, interestingly, if you want to reproduce a, <laughs> a, a Richard Prince re-photograph of some, uh, you have to pay Getty a lot of money. If you want to reproduce it large, it's going to cost you three hundred and seventy-five pounds. Or th there's a whole range of artists that are making work derived from Google Street View. That's could you say Google Street View has an author? Maybe it's a corporation. Do those images have an aesthetic? They definitely do. Uh, and Doug Rickard is an American artist who's very interested in the history of American color street photography. And he was finding images on Street View which had a relation to that tradition. I mean, obviously, street photography is usually about the instant you press the shutter. Uh, but you can't do that on Google Street View. Um, but you can frame things. You can zoom in, out, choose your position to some extent. Well, these examples just sort of add to the rich and complex way that artists have been reusing images for the last hundred years. Um, but the, the question of the ready-made never really comes up. It, it, it's something else. Picture by Anastasia Samoylova, uh, where she, she notices that uh, the way we photograph landscapes is often extremely conventional and repetitive. Anyone who's been on Instagram will know this. Uh, and she downloads the pictures and makes three-dimensional sculptures and then re-photographs that. So what, what you see on the gallery wall uh, is a large print of a sculptural arrangement of photographs. Is, is that a rectified ready-made or an assisted ready-made? Maybe. Or, oh, you don't need to read the text here. Uh, Aaron Heggett is a, a photographic artist. The, the picture on the left is his. And then he tells the Google image search algorithm to find an image that matches it. And then he, then he puts the two together. So, so he's leaving the choice to Google. Uh, uh, and of course, Google is blind. It's not, really, it's not really looking at images. It's looking at data, scanning data, and trying to quote unquote imagine what it is you want. I kind of like these because they do seem to have a relation to Duchamp and Coons <laughs> somehow. So one of the pictures is his and the other one is Google trying to find an image that matches it from images online. I think the closest we come though is um, a British artist called John Stezaker who uh, for over 40 years has made collages but recently he presented a series of works that were called unassisted ready-mades. Well, you'd think an unassisted ready-made is just a ready-made, wouldn't you? Why would you, why would you even say unassisted? Complicated. But I'll, I'll take you through, just very quickly, the, the different ways that Stezica makes work. Um, and he's always using existing images. He uses uh, popular postcards, film stills, reproductions of artworks from books. So let's think of these as four stages, which are increasingly simple. So one photograph selected, cut, and placed on another. You're, you're imagining something in your mind. I don't mind what it is. Number two, one photograph selected and placed uncut upon another. So one photograph with another photograph on top of it. One photograph selected and cut. One photograph selected. Hmm. Well, let's go through them. One photograph selected, cut, and placed upon another. So this would be a collage by Stezica. Two film stills are combined and you get this very androgynous, half-man, half-woman um, 
simply cutting one picture and placing it on top of another. Maybe that's as simple as collage could be, or maybe just placing one image on top of another, maybe that's even simpler. Maybe just cutting one photograph. It's one of my favorites of his, the voyeur. So you can imagine that that's a film still in which the woman, I think it's Faye Dunaway, is perhaps looking at a man. And Stezica has cut out the man, but of course sort of reinstates the man by cutting him out because he's now this very sort of sinister void or shadow or obstacle. But notice how the line of the cut goes through the white border as if the man might be outside the photograph. Or maybe you're at the cinema, you know, and a big guy sits in front of you and <laughs> blocks the screen. <laughs> All of these ideas are in play. So it's, it's a beautifully simple piece, I think. Duchamp would approve. In fact, Duchamp did make a number of cut pieces of his own profile, didn't he? Silhouettes, yeah. Very Duchampian piece. Um, Stezica had a chance to meet Duchamp, decided not to meet him when he was a student. I respect that. That's, uh... And he's, I was going to say made, but maybe he hasn't made. Um, he has presented recently a number of works that are just called unassisted ready-made, where he simply selected a photograph. And these are photographs that he buys from flea markets, thrift stores, or buys them online. So they once had a life, and now they don't, and he's rescued them, and they're now being given another complicated life. I asked him, you know, of all the pictures, why did you choose this one? And he said, he said, I really like the fact that it had a white scratch on it and it looked like the doctor was staring at the white scratch on the photograph. <laughs> that, that some, that somehow the casual handling of this picture had given it an interesting life and Stezica didn't have to do anything. He just said, look at this, here, here it is. Uh, un but I'm still perplexed by unassisted ready-made. Maybe he calls it unassisted because in, the previous, in his previous work, he had been assisting. <laughs> he had been doing things to and with the pictures. But maybe here he's not. It's hands-off and he's just presenting it. This, this is interesting. This one he was... It's declared as a work from 2016, but he told me that in the early 70s, his girlfriend handed him this photograph upside down, and he loved it upside down. That's how he first saw it, and, and almost 40 years later, it becomes an artwork. Maybe he, at a certain point, he feels brave enough that he doesn't even have to make a collage. You can just... Here it is. As, but he calls this assisted, assi assisted by the act of inverting the image. Well, Duchamp did that, didn't he? He, he turns the urinal 90 degrees and places it. It's definitely an object out of context. And, and so that must be an act of assisting, too. And so maybe, uh, if all ready-mades are assisted by the act of being re-presented and placed, and an assisted ready-made is not a ready-made, as we've discovered, Perhaps the ready-made only exists as an idea. Perhaps it really does only exist as an idea. And as soon as you actually have to make one, and I guess Duchamp did have to make one, he should have stopped at one. I don't understand why he made... 
why he well the copies are another matter but why why he did the bottle rack and that he could have just done it's all there in the urinal I think uh, but it's but no ready-made can really be a ready-made because the act of nominating it and presenting it is a transformation of it in itself. You are assisting it. And, assist, and an assisted ready-made is not a ready-made. So I think, I think a ready-made can only ever be an idea. And as soon as you realize that idea, as soon as you make it concrete, uh, you've you've failed, you've, you've compromised it. Thank you. <laughs>